So I'm going to record this first part of the session. I had a couple people reach out today and ask for that, but I'll turn it off before we do the Q&A just to make sure that everybody feels comfortable with that. Um, and I want to begin by introducing, or I should probably introduce myself for those of you that I don't know. I'm Barb. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at the OEN. Glad to see you today. I'm also the person you can reach out to if you have any questions as you're using it or you're running into anything and you're kind of like, I need to talk to someone about how to do this. I am gonna drop my email in the chat so that you've got that in the future. And then I want to introduce my colleague, Andy Seroff, who is here. If you wanna give a wave, Andy. Just, you Hello. Just <laughs> um, Andy is our developer at the OEN and he has he's the one behind the curtain, the one that has built out the dashboard for us. So um, yeah, Andy and Dave, our executive director and I meet weekly to discuss ways to improve the dashboard so that it best serves your needs. And um, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from you all over the past year or so. And so a big thank you to those of you who have shared your feedback with us. Because again, we do use it and we use it to make changes like these that really help serve the rest of the community as well. So um, thank you for sharing, because not only does it hopefully make your data collection better, but it does for the collective as well. So um, again, I, I mentioned we've made a, a lot of small changes over, like since we've rolled out the second version of the dashboard, but the two that we're gonna focus on today are adding multiple open educational resources to a single course in your dashboard. And then we've kind of beefed up what you can do with the tag feature, which basically is a way for you to customize the use of your dashboard and better organize your information. So um, I haven't really like figured out timing how long it'll take to move through that. I would guess maybe like 20 minutes or so, 15. And then at the end, we'll have time for a Q&A session if you do want to ask any specific questions about what we shared today, or if no one's really got questions on that material and they're just excited to be here, um, you can feel free to ask other dashboard questions you might have and maybe take advantage of Andy being here if you want to ask more like technical behind the scenes stuff because he's got all those answers and I most certainly do not. So by the way, if and when you ask me things like that, I always reach out to Andy. So now you know. Uh, if you've got questions along the way, I'm just going to kind of move through this. So drop your questions in the chat and I will try to address them. Or I'm sure if Andy's in the mood or has an answer that he can just type up quick, he can drop that in there as well. Um, and we will go from there. So as I share my screen, um, gonna hopefully find the right one here. Okay, so thumbs up if you can see me highlighting the word consortium, awesome. Okay, so um, we are going to, um, before we get started, I just wanna remind you when I'm talking about sharing your feedback about the dashboard, that could be ideas on how to improve it, like if you move through and you're like, hey, it'd be neat if this were possible. Or when I click here, it brings me here, but it'd be really cool if it dropped me here. Things like that. Or if you're experiencing some sort of glitch or bug, something wonky that you're just not sure is, is working correctly. Um, you can always email me, but probably the quickest way to, to get that addressed uh, is to complete this form. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, click the report issues or feedback option. And then it brings you to a Google form that Andy and I both get the, the responses to. So if I am like busy in email or vice versa, one of us is busy, the other one can get to it. So that's probably your quickest way to, to get feedback. And we welcome you to um, share your thoughts with us. So uh, today, as we move through the demo, I am going to be pretending that I am at Training Consortium. So this is our fictional account here not sharing anybody's data. As you will see, we've got some famous names in here. And then um, just note, if you are a consortium, that means that the view that you're seeing on my screen is going to be the same as yours. But if you're a, a member at a singular individual institution, 
there are a couple different things in here that are going to look a little different than what you see. So I'll try to point those out as we go. Um, but that is probably the case if, if I don't. And you're like, what is that thing I've never seen before? I'm not seeing that. That is why. All right. So um, I also just want to remind you that we've got our data dashboard documentation site. And as we start to look at adding multiple OER to an adoption, I'm just gonna drop the link to the page that you can find uh, that walks you through how to do this on the documentation site so that you know that you've got it on there. You can take a look under the adding an adoption heading and the same things I'm gonna show you now are outlined there as well. So you don't need to be taking copious notes. Okay, so um, I am going to find one of our lovely um, Open Education All-Stars, Mia Hamm, and we are going to play around with adoptions from her account. So to give you an idea of how this happened beforehand, um, when you would add an adoption, you would move through the process of adding a course and an adoption at the same time, uh, a, an adoption that correlated with that course so that you had those that information paired together. We heard from everybody that, hey, wait a second, sometimes my faculty adopt more than one OER per course, what do we do in that scenario? And we were like, thank you. We did not think about that when we were putting this whole thing together. So um, we kind of, put our heads together and what we decided to do was to separate out that process. So as um, instead of adding them both at once, you are going to start by adding a course and then from there you'll add the adoption. So in order to add the course, it looks a lot like it did before where you just hit this add course button and then you will type in your course name. Um, let's see, let's say math. 202. And as a reminder, you want to make sure that you've got your own naming best practices for courses and I'm guessing you probably want to align those with what your what that looks like at your university. Um, but you just click save and from there you will see that we just created a new course that does not yet have any adoptions added to it. So what you do as your step two is you click this add adoption button and that is going to walk you through adding all of the context for that particular adoption. Um, there's also, and you can start at the top here, you can select whether it's an open textbook from the open textbook library or indicate that it's other OER that's not necessarily in the OTL. Um, another new feature within that, if you choose a book in the OTL, it will automatically pull the subject area from that, um, from what it's correlated to in the Open Textbook Library and add that information to your dashboard. Uh, we've also made it so that if you choose other OER that's not in the Open Textbook Library, not only can you add the, um, title of that OER, but you can now select the subject area within the open textbook library that it would correlate to. So that's another improvement that we've made since um, this, since we rolled out the dashboard last summer. So um, I am just going to move through this really quick. You can add the replace textbook costs just like you could before and then indicate when the book started to be used. And then if there is a program that you'd like to attribute the, the textbook to, um, you can check that off here. As a reminder, we're adding this from um, Mia Hamm's profile. So when you see programs here, you're only going to see the programs that that participant has been a part of. Um, but perhaps, you know, if there was, if this person had been in three of your programs, they would all show up here and you'd have the ability to choose whether or not you wanted to attribute that adoption to a particular program, which would then be reflected in your reporting data. And then tags, which we'll talk about in a bit, you can always add a tag when you're adding an adoption. And then just click save. 
and there's a little bit of a delay. Um, but you can see now that for Math 202, which is what we just added, um, oops, sorry, did we not just add Math 202? Was it Bio 202? Bio 203. No, it, it was it was Math 202. Um, okay. It looks like it's been combined with uh, your other Math 202. Aha, uh, thank so you. So you, you added academic success here, uh, the second one. There it is. So good point. If you're adding the same course name, it will auto find that out for you and merge the two so that you um, are keeping your data as streamlined as possible. So thank you, Andy, for chiming in there. Um, so any questions about the adding of an adoption to a course? And then as you can see here, um, we can add another adoption. So since we merged the two Math 202s, it lists both of the textbooks that had been attributed to that course. If there's a third, like say there's some other type of OER that's not necessarily in the OTL, you can just select that, move through the screen and add it. And it will also add it to this lineup of um, open educational resources that are in use for that particular course. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if we're adding another OER that's not in the open textbook library, um, can we, for the title, is there a restriction on like how much can be in that box? Can we put a URL in that box or we should, can we just put a very long title? Ooh, um, good question. URL, I think, um, Andy, I'm gonna let you take this one. I think the answer is just text at the moment, but perhaps we could. Uh, yeah, I, so um, I would say that you could put whatever you wanted um, because this is basically just for your own information since it, since it's um, it, it doesn't like you know linked anything or anywhere so um, let's see yeah it's just going to appear if you close that modal for me um, or the the pop up uh, you can just see that the the value is just displayed as replaced textbook old textbook um, so whatever you put there is just going to show up there so if it's helpful to you to place a link there. Um, that's something that you are definitely willing, uh, you know, um, open to do uh, whatever is helpful. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, we also had a question in the chat. Um, what if the adopted text is the result of material from multiple OER texts? Um, so that would be the case where um, you've adopted one textbook and it replaced multiple uh, different things, I think, is uh, if I'm understanding the question properly. So um, again, the replaced textbook field is basically just open for whatever you want. So if you want to list, you know, comma separate, old textbook, comma, old uh, workbook, comma, um, you know, old PDF, and just list everything that it did replace. Uh, you, you can definitely do that. That's that field is basically just there for your own reference, um, and then you can, you know, add up the cost of all those things together and say, um, and put that as your replaced textbook cost. No pieces of multiple OER texts were mashed up to make a new OER. Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, then I would probably just use the new OER's title. Um, in the replace textbook field. Um, I don't know, Barb, do you? Yeah, I think this is just a great example and I appreciate you sharing this, Bill, of how you will run into situations like this where there's not a clear answer and or you might do it differently than another institution does. And it's just important to come up with a plan and stick to it. Um, over like the use of your dashboard. And also if you have more than one administrator locally to make sure that you're communicating with them about what that process is so that you can be sure to be consistent. So there is some freedom in terms of use to decide what's the best practice for you and your institution. Um, Cause maybe it would be valuable to you to see, you know, all of those listed out, but perhaps 
you know, if it is a new mashup and it fits all of the textbook, the criteria to be added to the open textbook library and it's different enough, then maybe you submit that and um, it's added to the OTL. So that's another throwing just a wrench in that and like another piece of the potential piece of the puzzle. So Bill, not to not give you an answer, but kind of the answer is that sometimes there are no answers and just being sure that you're deciding a way that works best for you and being consistent in that is, is the most important thing. I hope that help, is helpful at all. All right. Um, well, thank you for those questions. Again, keep those coming because kind of like you saw with that first question of like, can we add a URL? I'm like, I had never thought about that before. So this is also fodder for Andy and I to go back to Dave next week and, and bounce some new ideas around. So your feedback again, always helpful. The other thing that we were thinking about based on your input when we were putting this together is like, okay, well, you might want to add a text multiple OER to a single course but there's probably, you're gonna perhaps want to indicate which are active or which are inactive or not being used at the moment, but you might not necessarily want to like delete a, a formerly used open textbook or OER um, that is no longer in use just for your records. So in terms of managing the adoptions that are associated with your course, there's a couple things to make note of. Um, if and when you wanna edit, an adoption, you can, you just click this little, if you've not noticed, we love the pencil for the edit um, symbol. And you can also delete the adoption by just clicking this button. And then it's gonna ask you like, are you sure you wanna do that? And um, just click okay and go from there. And then um, going back to our math 202, you can see that that adoption is no longer recorded under that course. Another thing that you can do though, if you don't actually want to remove it is we have this mark ended button. So if you look here, it says when we started using the textbook, spring 2020. If that one is no longer in use, but you wanna keep that record in your dashboard, you can just click mark ended and then indicate when you stopped using or that faculty member, that course, whatever, stopped using that textbook and click submit. And it will, we pop up here soon, there we go. Um, it will then record that. So when you started using it, when they stopped using it, and if you ever wanna go back and change that, you can just click reactivate and it will, it will mark it as an active textbook. Um, something to note, which Andy, maybe you wanna chime in about this, in terms of best practice for um, recording enrollments when you do have more than one textbook in place, to just note that if there is a, a space between use time, like say you ended or um, stopped using a textbook in spring 2022, and then your next active textbook begins in spring 2023, um, you'll still see like a space to fill in enrollments for that semester, fall 2022, when there wasn't an open textbook in place. And just, you know, make note for yourself that you can possibly enter enrollments there, but you're not going to want to because there wasn't te a, technically a textbook in place. So just again, paying attention to the fields down here, matching up to just like double checking your work that because um, it's not going to like blank out an area where like a term in which the book wasn't used based on the dates that you have up here. All right. Um, and then just as a reminder, all of your, that's kind of, that's all we wanted to show you with adding multiple adoptions per course. Um, and as a reminder, you can find your adoptions information, like kind of a holistic view of all of your adoptions under the reports tab. So that is not different than before, but just a reminder of like, hey, now I wanna extract that information we just looked at, that's where you're gonna find that. All right, so now we are going to talk about tags. Um, and I feel like a little self-conscious during this part of the training session because I am from Minnesota and we are notorious for saying 
the way we say bags and now we're saying I'm saying tags a lot so apologies if I've got a Minnesota accent nails nails on the chalkboarding to you but we're going to get really Minnesota in here um so tags are what are tags tags are essentially labels that you as the administrator um use to mark your data that helps you organize your information in a way that that makes the most sense for your programs so as a reminder uh, just go as a reminder you can tag um three different things within your dashboard you can tag programs you can tag a user with a tag or you can tag an adoption as we just saw on the previous window um, and so I'm just going to show you places that you can find these tags before we kind of dive into them just to reorient you and, um, in case you do not remember. So when we're looking at our programs, if you click on the participants window, you can see, this is not a great one to show, um, a program that is tagged will have its tag show up um, on this this part up here so not a great example because I don't have any tags on this one um, but you can find it there you can also find tags within a participant profile so if we click on Jackie Joyner Kersey I think she has a tag she does not have a tag I've, I've been playing around in this all morning and clearly deleted it but this is another place that you can see tags in that user profile and you can just um, add them by typing into that field as a reminder and hitting enter and that will add the tag and to get rid of it you just click that x um oh and one more thing i wanted to show you with that actually um this little circle with the eye over it, or in it if you hover over it as you're thinking about tags um, and you want to make sure that you're consistently using the tags that you've already built into your system, if you just hover over that little circle, you'll see a list of all the tags that you've used before. So hopefully that will jog, help jog your memory if you're not remembering quite exactly how you phrased tags that you've already designated for folks, adoptions, or programs in your dashboard. Um, and then uh, the last place to find tags, we're going to go back to Mia here, just as a reminder, uh, is under the adoptions tab um, underneath a user profile. So again, here is that third place that you can find tags or add tags. Tag and McTag face. Yes, Katie. I was hoping someone would recognize that. I will, that's a great segue to move back to our tags tab. Um, we have put in examples here. Coming back to the comment in the chat, one of the last ones on here. It's kind of fun to make up fake names. I don't know if anyone saw the Bodie McBoat face and the way the internet has come together to win like naming con uh, competitions, Bodie McBoat face. We actually in Minnesota had have also embraced that where when we get new snow plows, um, we have people submit names of what we should name our snow plows and plowy plow face one for one of our districts here. So there's thank you for appreciating that dashboard humor. Anyways, so back to tags when you click the we've now shown you where you can find them and how you can add them. Um, I do want to make one more note before kind of jumping into this tab. I just showed you that you can add a tag to your to an adoption on your end as the administrator. I do want to make it clear that tags are you as the administrator only. If you send out an activity request to a faculty member and they add an adoption uh, of theirs, they do not have the ability to add tags because they're obviously not the one organizing all of this data in the dashboard itself. So just a little side note, best practice that if you do have faculty adding their own adoptions and you have certain tags that you might wanna apply to those records just to go back and review uh, the information, monitor those as they add them to make sure that your tags are consistent. Okay. Um, so this is our tag tab. And um, when you click on the tag tab, this is essentially going to be 
a list of all of the tags that you have built into your dashboard. And then you can just see a snapshot of the number of programs, users, and or adoptions that are associated with um, that tag. Just a fun fact, we've got these like little ghost arrows up here that if you click on them, you can um, organize the, inf or the information will be organized um, numerically. So if that's helpful for you at all, um, that is a possibility. And then here you've got your snapshot. If you wanna dig deeper into one particular tab, um, you just click on the tab itself or sorry, tag itself. And this will pull up just more context on that particular tag. So you can see just not only the number of programs, users and adoptions that are associated with that particular tag, you can see actually which program, which user, which adoptions, and then it's an easy access point to get back into that information if need be. Also at the top here, when you, you see your tag, We've got another edit pencil. So if you click that pencil, you can rename the tag across all of the instances in which it shows up in your dashboard. So if you made a spelling error or if you changed your mind and you wanna name it something else, you're like, oh, 2022 is just way too much. I'm gonna change it to fall 22 just to, to keep it nice and short. That's how you do that. So again, you just click that pencil, type it in, click rename, and that will change it across your dashboard so that it's consistent and you don't have to go into, you know, like hunting down each instance and changing it manually. All right. One thing about the dashboard that I am going to point out that I just experienced um, sometimes if you're in a window like this and you click something and another little mini window pops up. I always wanna like click outside of that window to make it go away. And you actually have to click back on the button or the icon that got you there in the first place for it to disappear. So just a little user memo there. Okay, and then um, let's see. Before we move into how tags show up in reports, I'm just going to drop the dashboard documentation link in the chat. I think this might be a different page, as I recall. It might be the same one, but um, that's the page that you can find a little more context on the tags. It's under the adoptions heading. Um, there's a little explanation kind of of what we just covered here. Okay, so um, another thing that is new with tags since we have rolled out the dashboard last year is that um, they're, the tag reports are ready to go. So now you can also pull reports based on the tags that you've got built into your dashboard. Um, this is, you know, with from within the same tag window, this is one place that you can download a report. So if I wanted to come look at my fall 2022 tag and download all of the information that I'm seeing here. You just click that button and it'll download a spreadsheet that organizes, oops, I shouldn't have closed that, that is um, organized into three different tabs. So the tabs are going to correlate to the programs that have that tag attached to it. The users is the second tab. And then the third tab has all of the information that you see here for the adoptions that are associated with that tag. So Again, kind of like a user experience note, if you download that spreadsheet, that report on this a particular tag and it pulls up and you're like, wait, it only lists the users. Make sure you're looking at the bottom of the document and you've got the other information on those other two tabs. I definitely did that the first time I looked at the spreadsheet. So hopefully that saves you time if you're like me. Okay, um, the next place that you can find tag reports is obviously where all the other reports live under the reports tab. And there are two places that you can see it in here. We've got a data slice that correlates to tags. So um, if you're in the reports tab and you wanna just pull up information on one of your tags, uh, for example, taggy McTag face, um, you just choose that tag and click view, 
And it'll bring you to that same summary window where you can download that same spreadsheet. So just a different pathway to arrive at that same place with that same report. And then if we scroll up to our data downloads section, uh, there is also the ability to click download tag data and that will um, download a CSV file that is essentially what you see here, just a listing of all your tags as well as the programs, users and adoptions that are associated with each and in case that way of representing your data is more helpful to you. All right, Andy, anything you wanna add about tags or adoptions or other new features that we've implemented over the past, that you've implemented over the past year? That we implemented over the past year. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think um, you did a good job covering it. I just want to say that like, I feel like we know that there is a lot of room for growth here. And so I just want to encourage everyone again to, you know, if you have just an idea about how it could be um, more helpful to you, um, like, you know, if like are the, especially the like reports, um, you know, if there's something missing um, that would help you and it would probably help someone else too. Um, so we'd love to hear um, just general feedback about um, what's valuable in um, across the tags feature. Awesome. And I just dropped the link uh, to that form where you can submit that feedback that you can also find again when you're in your dashboard. So with that, that is the summary of the big changes we've made. So I'm going to stop the recording now and then we'll just transition into the Q&A 